this episode, we'll be learning about grief and suffering from a grief recovery specialist. She's a risky master, a certified coach, and the creator and podcast host of Grieving Voices. Welcome to the show, Victoria. How are you doing? I'm amazing. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to chat with you today. I'm super delighted to be speaking with you also. I'm looking forward to learning so much from you in this soulful conversation. I would just love us to, you know, kick off from your own experience. You know, um, you, you, are, you bring a very unique perspective to grief that's based on being a child griever and your life experience that followed afterwards, which also led to you, you know, starting your podcast, wrote a book about this also. So I would, I would just love us to, you know, kick off from that and learn from your own experience like how was it like for you being a child griefer and how was life afterwards for you well in hindsight so much of my life makes sense to me now knowing what i know about energy the energy of grief and just myself in general like my personality and and who i am and but grief came into my life at a very young age. My dad would have been, I would have been around six when my dad was diagnosed with cancer and he was sick for a good 18 months before he passed. And I was eight when he passed. But the year prior to that, my grandmother, my mother's mother was also dying of melanoma. And so my mother was just beside herself, of course. And I was the youngest of four. And so I was really lost in the shuffle, right? There wasn't time for me because my mom was rightfully so focused on her mother because she actually lived with us for a time and my father and his care. And when she passed and then my father passed, um, she didn't give herself the time to grieve. She didn't allow herself the time to grieve and quickly jumped into another relationship and marriage. And, and then my sister, who was like a second mom to me, had moved away. She graduated from high school and I was sexually abused. And so there was a lot of change and a lot of trauma in a short period of time, mm. a lot of grief and a lot of loss. Yeah. And I did not have the tools, especially at that age, or the heart with ears in my life to help me process what I was feeling and experiencing. And so as children do, we make up our own stories. Mm -hmm. And I grew up with this belief that when you died, you just went in the ground and that was it. There was no connection that could be maintained with your loved one. There was, so my spirituality, really just, it didn't exist. I didn't feel a connection to God or a higher power or whatever you want to say. I was angry at God because of all of this stuff that was happening to me. And this feeling continued into adulthood where I just would find myself in situations where I would, this unresolved grief would just creep up over and over and I would have incidences happen that just led me to the another belief that I was just meant to suffer for the rest of my life. Like this is just my life. I am, I'm meant to just feel like I'm going crazy all the time. Like this is my existence and my relationship suffered. I had difficulty in many friendships. I it took so much to heart. I didn't handle criticism well. Um, I had a very low self-esteem and self-worth. Mm -hmm. And again, no tools, no communication around what to do with all this stuff. And so for me, it turned into uh, a lot of anger, mm -hmm. internal anger, and a lot of resentment. And in grief recovery, we say that you know, resentment is a poison in that you take wishing someone else would die. Mm -hmm. And it was really, truly affecting me in, in causing the suffering from the inside out and grief. What it does is it manifests some way, either outwardly, you know, with angry outbursts, which I would have, 
um, or it becomes physical symptoms, which was also the case for me. I at 16, I was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. Um, I have issues from time to time now, uh, but in hindsight, I know that that was all of this trauma and this grief that wasn't being processed or dealt with. And generally, I mean, it makes sense, right? That our digestive system is our processor of our food, but mm -hmm. if we aren't processing our emotions, we become emotionally constipated too. <laughs> and sure. so elimination of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and also of our emotions is so important for us to maintain this balance and, and equilibrium so that when life comes at us, we aren't completely derailed and that with tools and knowledge and choice, because we always have a choice, we can take different action and we can change our behaviors and our response mm -hmm. to what is happening to us, yeah. for us, mm -hmm. for our growth. And I know that people are probably going to hate hearing that and roll their eyes that terrible things happen for our growth. And I'm not exactly saying that explicitly, but growth is a byproduct of pain and suffering. That's true. It can be. Mm -hmm. Or we can wallow in it and let it just let us decay from the inside out. I mean, the choice is ours, right? Yeah, that's true. That's very, very it's true. It's more empowering. It's more empowering mm -hmm. to take your own life by the horns and take different action. Learn the tools, learn the knowledge to turn your life around. But for me, it took over 30 years to wake up to... The fact that my own potential was suffering. My relationships were suffering. My ability to make money was suffering. Um, it impacts every area of our lives. Every yeah. area. Yeah. Well, I, I'm so sorry for, for the loss that you suffered and, you know, for the whole experience that you had. But I, I must say, I admire your strengths and the, the boldness, the courage to be able to pull through like you know going through the the trauma of you know losing your father and you know also being sexually abused and you you came out strong and today you are helping other people there to recover from your grief also that's a wonderful thing that you're doing and i i so much agree with what you said about growth like you went through all of these painful things all of these um things that one does not desire for but then you came out as a Hopefully, I believe a better person that you you could have ever come out from, and that's that's growth basically. You know, going through that process of you know ma making a diamond, which is like going through fire, going through the beatings, going through the whole you know um, difficulties, basically to come out shining and bright like you are right now. That's awesome. That's wonderful. That's and we great. all have that that ability. Yeah, I'm not special. Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not. There's nothing special about me. And it really it was as recent as 2019. I thought I was doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. And end of 2018, I lost a friendship that just kind of a friendship. But then even before that, my uncle, my last living relative of my father was diagnosed with terminal with brain cancer. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't seen him since my father's funeral. And I went to see him in the hospital. I didn't know if he'd recognize me. I didn't even know if he'd want to see me, but I felt this pull and this draw that I needed to go see him. Not even just for myself, but I think there was a part of me that felt like this was, it was for him too. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I, I had this sense that he had this regret and he had this, um, this sadness that he was carrying that he wasn't there for me too, right? When my father passed away, because they were very close as brothers. Mm -hmm. And it changed my whole perspective of, you know, this, the importance of completion before we pass, so the importance of, the importance of, um, Sometimes the healing isn't just about us. It's for others too. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it changed. It it really was a transformative transformative moment for me. And um, it was while I was editing the book. It was in the editing phase of the book, and um, that was just a very important moment for me. I felt really connected to my father too in a way that I hadn't before that yeah. as well. So it was a really deep spiritual experience for me, actually. Yeah. I, I'm so glad that you just made mention of your, your book right now, because in the book, you detailed like the journey that you went through, including the spiritual journey that you had to embark on, like you, you said while talking earlier. And this book of yours is entitled The Guided Arts. It's available on Amazon. And I will encourage everyone out there to just click on the link that will be in the show notes of this episode to get a copy of the book or just to read about it. It could be downloaded as ebook or on your Kindle, for example, or you could get the paperback also. So you, you write about, you know, your journey of finding this um, spiritual solace, for example, and you talked about also you, I, in my opinion, you are vulnerable, like you explained into details about your father and everything that you have to go through. Can you tell us more about this book, the inspiration behind the book and the spiritual journey that you embarked on? Yeah, in the book, really, if I, if I could rewrite some bits of it now, I would, <laughs> because <laughs> I've learned so much about grief and about myself since publishing it. Mm -hmm. um, it really is what I was experiencing at the time, like what I was finding helpful for me. And, and at the time when I published it and even up to 2018 and before my uncle passed, I thought I was doing really well. I really did. I thought I'm in a good place, doing really well. But then I lost that friendship that really just made me realize, like, why am I getting so, like, it just brought up so much for me mm. of abandonment, of, it just brought up things that I knew I needed to heal and that I wasn't okay. And, it, and, and that's what loss does, right? And grief, that's what, when we come into relate, when we're in relationship with people, people disappoint us. Yeah. People don't meet our expectations all the time. Mm -hmm. but rather than looking at it like something that they're not doing or they're not living up to in your eyes, what is that saying about what you need to give yourself? Mm -hmm. What are you looking in for in that person that you are not giving to yourself? And that's what came out of that experience for me. Mm -hmm. I found grief recovery and I realized I didn't have boundaries. I didn't even know what a boundary was. Mm -hmm. And this person was placing boundaries with me. And it was very uncomfortable. I didn't like it. And I didn't understand why. Mm -hmm. But I was like a vamp, an energy vampire. Mm -hmm. Because I was trying to take something that I wasn't from someone else that I was not giving myself. Yeah, come with some more so, details about that. Yeah. Yeah. So that book is really at the time, what mm -hmm. I was what I was finding helpful for me. But there's a part in there too, where I talk about the stages of grief and there's, there's no stages of grief. Grief is not a linear experience. And there's actually an episode with Ken Ross, uh, the son of Elizabeth Kubler Ross, who wrote that, whose work is based, that, that work is based off of her work. Like the idea of the five stages of grief is based off of Elizabeth Kubler Ross's work. And her son was on my podcast and we talked about the five stages. Um, there's actually more than like 10. There's actually like 10 in her work, but mm. society just focused on the five stages and that's what she became famous for. And it was only like just this small piece of her work. She was an amazing woman. Mm. Um, I encourage anyone to learn more about Elizabeth Kubler Ross, but, um, yeah, so that, that's where I was at the time. I do have another book in me. Um, it's brewing. Yeah. It's not, I haven't started writing it yet. I think it's still percolating. So. Yeah. Awesome. We'll be looking forward to that. Would that also be related to grief also, or like life after grief or. <laughs> Ooh, you know, I, I, there's only a smidgen of my story in this, in my book, mm. in the, the book I've already published and. I think I could go, I could go deeper, but I wasn't ready at the time. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to go like really deep at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think when I write my next one, it'll be, 
it'll be deep, really yeah. deep. <laughs> we'll be looking forward to that. We'll be looking for the book. Looking Thank forward you. to the book. Yeah. And, you know, when you were talking about your book earlier, you talked about the boundaries that this other person was setting, and you, you, that at that moment you were like someone that was a vampire, you know, energy vampire, basically. You know. Yeah. So, can you tell us about these boundaries that we need to set, or that other people have to set in order to um, ensure that everything is still in place while grieving? You know, we learn boundaries as children mm. and we, many of us grow up without them. Um, <laughs> we don't understand the privacy of others necessarily. We don't understand, um, especially with child abuse, ch um, children who are receive, you know, are victims of child abuse. There's a lot of boundaries that are crossed, right? We you come out of that situation with no, um, with lack of safety and security. Uh, so you might actually find yourself in relationships where those boundaries are crossed over and over and over, uh, because it's really scary to implement those boundaries when you don't know what they look like because you've never experienced them. Mm -hmm. Um, our self worth really is developed in childhood. And I think that's where we, if we aren't nourished in that way and aren't given the tools and the knowledge and education around boundaries and self-worth and things like that, as an adult, those, what we learn is we, we resort to. Mm -hmm. And so when others are putting boundaries on us and we never learn them as children, we get angry, we get mm -hmm. resentful. We want to fight back. We, think someone's they th we think that person is doing something to us right we feel like a victim and so many grievers get stuck in the victimhood of their own experience mm -hmm. as i did i have a whole chapter about the victimhood of grief yeah. victimization of grief right mm -hmm. and it's grief itself is not the scapegoat it's not putting yourself in the way of new tools and new knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's a choice that we make. Yeah. And I'm, that's why I'm saying it's so empowering to seek out knowledge, to yeah. learn new tools. It's empowering. Yeah. But yeah. it's, you can't, if you don't do anything with it, <laughs> it's no good anyway. Right. So yeah. the power is actually in the action. Mm -hmm of using that knowledge and the new tools. Yeah. And what's, what's the best way to, you know, gain this knowledge that we need, the tools that we need? What's the best way? I mean, apart from listening to your podcast and reading your book, I did like some ways that you advise everyone out there who's, you know, going through a, a form of grief or the other. Uh, how can they gain this um, support that they need, knowledge that they need, and the tools that they need to really process their grief? Probably not another griever <laughs> who's in the same boat as you mm. uh, because they've learned the same crap growing up, right? Like mm. you can't learn from someone who's alongside you or 10 steps behind you, right? You've mm. got to learn from someone who's a little bit further than you. Mm. And there's, we live in an amazing time. Like I grew up in the eighties. There was no communication about grief. There was, it, you know, my school had no idea what to do with me as a grieving child. Mm -hmm. No idea. Nowadays, we've got, you know, helping children with loss program, which is for caregivers and caretakers of children who are grieving. There is a book on which that program is based on. It's called When Children Grieve, which is now in Spanish also mm -hmm. um, and on Audible and on Amazon. Um, the Grief Recovery Handbook, uh, written and co-authored by the um, founder of the Grief Recovery Institute, John James, who recently passed away. But he, the Grief Recovery Institute is the first and foremost authority on grief. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross definitely is up there, of mm -hmm. course. A mm -hmm. lot of her work, though, um, was based off of her work in hospice. Uh, which I'm an end of trained end of life doula and understand the importance of um, having a good death and that that's possible. Um, that's another 
podcast episode probably in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but there is so much information out there and it's, but I think too, you have to be open to hearing it because you can hear the same thing five times and you might not hear it, but on the sixth time, it's like, Ooh, that clicked. Like you're open to receiving the message. Mm-hmm. And I think when you've been suffering for so long, people close themselves off. It's like we, we have earmuffs on, like we just don't hear what's good for us. We don't hear what's possible. We don't, we can't take in information if we're not ready to hear it. And so I think that's really the first step. And that's honestly, a, that can be a very long journey for some people. For me, it was over 30 years, right? I was ready. So I went looking for the information. And that's probably the first step Yeah, is get ready. Yeah. I mean, I, I totally, that totally makes sense to me. I totally agree with that. You have to be ready and open to receive those yeah, those tools and knowledge from books, from conversations, from people that I experienced already. Yeah. And w- would you say one ever stops grieving? For example, like I know you, at a very tender age, you, you know, you, you lost your father. Would you say you, at a point in your life, you stopped grieving or is something that goes on forever? I do not get caught up in my own story. And I can tell my story without being a puddle on the floor and without it like derailing my day or right now, like when I talk about my story, it like just fuels my fire more. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it's a different feeling that I get. It's not one of woe is me. This happened to me crying and there's nothing wrong with that i'm just i'm telling you there's nothing wrong with that everyone's at their own place in their journey wherever they're at i honor that but i was sick of that i was absolutely sick of that because it was impacting every area of my life and i was tired of it impacting every area of my life i was ready to move on (laughs) but i didn't know how yeah. You know, we're taught how to acquire things and people, but we're not taught what to do when we lose them. Mm-hmm. And so I got sick and tired of being sick and tired yeah. and did something about it. And um, so, yeah, that's that's when you know you're heal, healing is that you can talk about your story and it's not going to derail you the rest of the day or mm-hmm. take you out emotionally for a week or months yeah. or downward spiral you into these thoughts of, you know, let's say it was someone that you didn't, that you had a less than loving relationship and they passed away and you're talking about them. And then you start feeling yourself getting angry and resentful and they did this and they did that and da, 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 da. And then you go on and on and on. You're wrapped up in your story. Yeah. That's showing you where you have work to do, where the work is. That's where the work is. That's true. They want us to like, dive deeper into that area and work on it and find solutions, find ways to clarify that. And it doesn't mean I don't get sad. Mm. Like even after I've gone through all this work and I've done so much of my own inner work, it doesn't mean that I still don't get sad. Mm. My dad is still not here. My son's going to graduate. He's a senior. My, mm. my father won't be there. Mm. Like I've had all these milestones throughout my life and my children's births and all of this stuff that he hasn't seen. He wasn't there to share it with me. Mm. Or was he not there? That's the thing. Like spiritually, yeah. that changed for me too, right? Mm. But mm. I had to like work to get there. I had to work to get here. Mm. It took me over 30 years to get to where I was. Yeah, It's taken time too to get to where I am. Mm. I'm not saying that grief recovery is a magic pill. And that it's like, boom, your life is like completely transformed. Mm -hmm. But your relationship that you work on, the one relationship and the relationships that you continue to apply the tools of grief recovery to change like that. They do. That I I can say with 100% certainty in my heart (laughs) (laughs) because it changed my life. It changed Mm -hmm. my relationships that I worked through using those tools. Yeah. 
Well, that's, that's awesome. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad that we have people like you to help people process their graves and to, to work on it. And you using your 30 years of um, experience also, you know, goes a long way, basically. And, you know, at, at the early stage, for example, of, of grief, one, one goes through a lot of chaos, basically, like it's a lot of things mentally, physically, spiritually, a lot of chaos, actually. How, how can one at that early stage or in the, maybe in the early 10 years, for example, really understand the chaos and deal with the chaos and, you know, be able to overcome that chaos and everything that comes with the grief at that early stage? You know, my, I grew up with my grief mm -hmm. and that children grievers grow up with their grief. It's at every phase and every stage of their lives. And mm -hmm. so this is, there is no one answer for that. Like what it's like, what do you do? It depends on where you're at. You have to meet yourself where you're at. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you're an adult and you've never experienced loss up until that point, you're going to probably handle it very differently than someone who's known grief for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So it will be every, you know, we all grieve at a hundred percent. There's no half grievers and every grief experience is unique. I don't care if you've had two people, the exact same loss, exact same home, exact upbringing, maybe they're even twins. Their experience is still 100% unique and individual to them because the relationships were unique with that person, mm -hmm. yeah. right? We don't yeah. have the same relationship with, with others. Uh, and so what to do in those early times, meet yourself where you're at, not where your friend's at, not where your relative is at mm -hmm. and not judge them where they're at either. <laughs> Because some people might say, well, she's not even grieving. She's got it all figured out. She's good. She's happy. She's fine. Mm -hmm. You know, people say, I'm fine. In grief recovery, we say fine is feelings inside not expressed. Mm. So someone may appear like they're fine, but inside it's, can I swear? Can I swear? <laughs> yeah, you're free. free. It's a shit show. <laughs> On the inside, it's a shit show, right? Yeah, yeah. You feel like a shit show. You feel like you're going out of your mind. Mm. But you try to, like, put on this front that you've got it together. you got to be strong. It's all these myths of grief. Don't feel bad. Replace the loss. Um, be strong for yourself and others. Mm. And we've all grown up with these ideas and beliefs around grief because we've not been taught otherwise. Mm -hmm. And again, we resort to what we know. Yeah. 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 Awareness that... is what changes our behavior. Mm -hmm. Awareness meeting action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's a very valid point that you just made right now. Like we, we, are, we grew up with a lot of misconceptions, some, a lot of means about grief. And I would love you to help us clarify that. What are some misunderstandings, some misconceptions around grief that we have to clarify and, you know, maybe reorientate ourselves on. Yeah. So early on in childhood, often people that lose a pet, right? That's one of the first losses. And the parent might say, well, that's okay, Toby, we'll get another dog. Hmm. Okay. We'll replace the loss. And they probably said, you know, don't feel bad, right? We'll get another dog. So mm -hmm. don't feel bad. Replace the loss, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you keep on crying about it, I'll give you something to cry about. Mm -hmm. So go grieve alone. Go to your room and cry. I don't want to see it, right? There's three myths right there of grief. Mm -hmm. So don't feel bad. Replace the loss. Grieve alone. Be strong for others and yourself. That was another one I had mentioned, you know, someone who is like the type A, especially personality that takes control of everything. They're probably going to be the epitome of being strong mm -hmm. for everyone and everyone, for everyone around them. Mm -hmm. They don't have time to crumble. They don't have time <laughs> to lose it. Yeah. And I imagine though, as a parent, 
if you lost your spouse and you are a parent, I cannot fathom. Like, I cannot fathom what my mother's experience was. I was not her. Mm. But she felt she needed support from someone else. And that's why she jumped into another relationship. She replaced her loss. She felt like she couldn't do it alone. She had a lot of self-worth issues, a lot of guilt that she was dealing with, right? So she was scared. She made a decision out of fear, mm. like we often do. Yeah. Yes. You know, is this a fear-based decision or is this a love-based decision? And hers mm. was definitely out of fear. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the grief recovery handbook is, I would say, the one of the best resources out there for learning about grief in these myths mm. and to really make sense of what, as a listener, you're likely experiencing. Mm -hmm. And no one has to die to grieve either, right? When you think of grief, well, someone died. Yeah. You can yeah. have loss of a dream. Mm -hmm. You know, we say grief is a loss of hopes, dreams, and expectations. And anything that you wish would have been different, better, or more. And I think all of us can say that we wish something would have been different, better, or more of our experience with COVID. Mm -hmm. All of us are grieving something yeah. or someone. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're right. You're very right. And I, I love the, the um, example you made with your mom, for example, like when you were talking about a uh, case, it, I just had this illustration in my head that, you know, grieve in what, whatever we will form, maybe losing someone or losing a dream, for example, leaves this hole or a gap in our, in our life. And from what I understood from what you said, we should not be in an hurry to just fill up that hole with whatever to replace a loss, like a pet that you know, died and we just what a new dog, for example, but well, we should take that time to really you know, recover from that hole that has been left and then take the time to then fill it up over the years after fully recovering. And, and, and a tool to, we can use to recover is, you know, getting a, a books, for example, materials that we could read, people that we could speak to, people that could mentor us, for example, that could guide us on this journey of recovery, basically. Yeah. Yeah. And when you say recovery, thank you for using that word, because that's really what it is. It's and what that really means to us in grief recovery is becoming emotionally complete. Mm. Like there is nothing else that I can emotionally, that I have emotionally like stuck within me. I've expressed it. I've gotten it out. Mm -hmm. I've left everything on the table emotionally. Mm -hmm. it, it's that emptying out of what we're storing emotionally. It's mm -hmm. that emotional constipation. I come back to that. It's that yeah. emotional constipation that we need to release mm -hmm. in a safe, guided way because there is a lot of bad advice out there when it comes to grief. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we have this conversation also, <laughs> just to let go of those bad comments. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, earlier you talked about sometimes we, we ask our friends, for example, or even people ask us when we are go going through different difficult situations, I would say, yeah, I'm fine. Even though, you know, deep down, you know, things are happening and we're not actually fine. And earlier you also talked about, you know, when you are grieving and you suppress everything, like you having this like bo um, issues with your bowels, for example, that, and that's where grief, you know, manifests, you know, in people's life or also in our, in our health also. So as, as vigilant friends or maybe family member, maybe a dear husband or a dear wife or a, a good friend, basically, how can we, what, can, what should we look out for in the life of our friends out there, people out there that are grieving to know that, oh, this person, is you know undergoing something bad even though uh, they say they are fine what should we look out for what are what are the ways that you know grief manifests in people's life or in our lives that we could look out for and how can we you know come in as friends also to help us create and provide support basically and create a wonderful environment for them to recover i love how you worded that create a wonderful environment for them because that's really what in the when i think of a heart with years mm of what you can be for someone. That's what I think of is just this, you're like this warm, cuddly blanket, right? But you're not judging, you're not analyzing, you're not criticizing. Mm -hmm. That's the way you can be a heart with ears. And often it's not people who are closest to us that are the best people for that because the people closest to us have skin in our game. 
Mm. Any changes that we make in our lives might affect them. And remember what I said about boundaries. When we start to realize that we don't have them and we start to implement them, it can rub, it can rub people the wrong way, including friends, including family, right? Yeah, yes. When you start saying no, when you've always been a yes person, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. all of a sudden you're not the go-to and people are like, whoa, what's mm. wrong with her? All yeah. of a sudden she's not, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's, it's finding the people who can be that person for you, who can just hold space. That's kind of a buzz phrase right now, but it really is just someone who's not going to analyze, criticize, or judge your experience and what you share. And that's why so many people have a hard time finding a heart with ears or finding that person because first of all, you're so close to your own story, but so are your friends and family. Those closest to you are close to your story, right? Mm -hmm. It might impact them too. And so having like a third party disinterested third party that you can go to is often the best because you can't see the label from inside the jar. You're not going to be able to see what others can reflect back to you who don't have any skin in your game. Mm -hmm. So, but you can open that door to help someone realize for themselves that maybe they need help. Or that maybe they need to talk to someone, even if it's not you. And in grief recovery, people often resort to what we call STIRBs, short-term energy-relieving behaviors. When we're feeling emotionally put up against the wall and either grief will manifest, like I said, physically, or will act out in behaviors to help us feel better. So we might go and drop $5,000 at the mall. You might go and drop 5,000 at the gambling hall or the bingo hall. Mm -hmm. You might go drop 5,000 when at a bar tab, right? You Mm -hmm. know, drinking every night of the week or weekend. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not drinking every night of the week or the weekends, if you're resorting to alcohol to feel better, binge drinking or whatever it is, there, there's an indicator there, right? That there is something that needs to be worked through with your relationship with alcohol and others can see that you you might be drinking more you might be gambling you might be shopping more you might be having these angry outbursts more you might be sleeping more you might be not sleeping right (laughs) there's like all these behaviors um you could be jumping from one relationship to the next well you know just not giving yourself the time to like stop, reflect, reassess, right? You're just going on through life, like on autopilot. Yeah. Like a lot of us do, like yeah. we have to stop and pause and assess and see where we're at. And oftentimes just doing that and looking at our relationships with others, like, oh, are they not communicating as much? And they always used to, like, are they disinterested in things that used to make them happy? And now all of a sudden they're disinterested. Mm-hmm. you know yeah so one has to be very very you know vigilant in, in that case like you know very observant and i, I love that when talking about you know um meeting third parties or, or people outside the jar basically people that, know, that don't have any skin in the game so like people that can look at us from a better perspective and say oh yeah this is what is up with you toby or this is what is also up with you victoria and it can uh, assist us better and if you are feeling concerned for someone just not being accusatory, like, oh, I see you drinking a lot more. Do you have a, is there something bothering you? Or, you know what I mean? Like not, that's, you don't want those for, to be your first words. I see you doing this. You know, I've noticed a change in your behavior. Or I've noticed a change in, in how you interact with me or whatever. Not, you know, you just want to be careful of using words that, would get that person to feel defensive, right? Because they're gonna shut down. Mm -hmm. So even just continually sending messages or giving a phone call, hey, how are you doing today? No, really, how are you doing? I'm concerned for you. Mm -hmm. You don't have to like get all wordy and make it complicated. Just simply like, 
I just have a feeling or I just have this, I feel this vibe, right? Mm -hmm. And I deal with energy a lot and I'm an energy worker. And so it's a lot of like, I energetically feel like there's something you're struggling with. Is this, is that true? Mm. You know, yeah, yeah. I just want you to know I'm here for you. If you ever need someone, mm -hmm. just something like that. Like, again, we complicate the shit out of trying to be helpful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And uh, we, you're totally right. I mean, so there's something that could be as simple as possible, but then, yeah, because sometimes we could be too caring and that's too care. And that's, act of being too caring could make the other person shut shut down basically <laughs> so send, sometimes... a, send some snail mail right send a card like how many yeah. people do mail now right <laughs> at least yeah not so many people yeah <laughs> that's true yeah that's good that's very good and you know sometimes like going back to what you said earlier that grief doesn't have to be about losing somebody it doesn't have to be you know about some passing away in the family or something like that or you're losing a friend it could also be about maybe any other thing losing maybe a friendship for example mm -hmm. like you, you experienced also in the past or maybe someone hurting you in, your, in one way or the other so how, why is um forgiveness important as an aspect of grief and um how can we forgive when we are actually in this process of recovering from our grief or still in the grief itself. Hmm. I'm going to say something I don't think I've ever said before on a podcast interview hmm. because forgiveness was a huge component for me, obviously. And it was one, it is one of the hardest aspects of grief recovery in, in the grief recovery program, but it is an evidence-based program. And there's a reason why it works. Mm -hmm. because we do this hard stuff. And one of those steps is for, about forgiveness. And there is a way to do it that feels good to you if you're not quite there yet, especially in the case of abuse or just notorious acts. But how I want to say this is that the person that you feel like you can't forgive is not sitting at home worrying about you not forgiving them most likely they're not worried about your feelings necessarily True. right yeah so who's the one suffering <laughs> the person that's not forgiven yeah exactly comes back to that resentment mm. that's poison we take hoping the other person dies mm. And if you are listening to this and you feel like you need forgiveness for something, what you really probably need to do is apologize. Mm. And if you're listening for the listening to this and you think you need an apology, mm -hmm. you could be waiting a very long time. Mm. And while you're waiting, mm. instead of forgiving and you're waiting for an apology, you're in emotional jail. We keep ourselves in emotional jail, waiting for an apology we'll never get, and being unwilling to forgive. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're the ones suffering. Mm -hmm. And that shifted so much for me and has ever since. Because if you can have something happen in your day that feels like an act that's to you, right? This is where we get, this is why we get stuck is a feeling like a victim. Because we, we hold on, we don't let go, and we can't for, allow ourselves, to, we don't allow ourselves to forgive. Yeah, that's true. But I yeah, I was just gonna, a simple example, if someone mm -hmm. is, does something terrible in traffic to you, or you're treated poorly somewhere, mm. that can derail your entire day. Like you might, and you might repeat that story 15 times to whomever will listen the rest of the day. Yeah. Is that other person thinking about you and what they did? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's unnecessary suffering. Mm. And we do this to ourselves daily. Mm. Forgiveness is the tool to freedom emotional freedom yeah you're right no i know no matter i mean it could be very very difficult no matter how difficult it is 
for us to, to let go. You know, because, you know, whenever we don't forgive, we are feeling this hunger in us, this, um, this right that we have in us that, yes, I, I'm, I'm right. And I, I, I owe this, you know, I owe this, I owe this, I owe this right to be, to be apologized to, for example. And once we, if we can grow beyond letting go of that right or letting go of that hunger or that, or those grudges in us, then we won't be able to move forward in life. Like you just said. Yeah. And to take it deeper, because mm. people might be like, well, you just, people say you just got to let go, but they don't tell you how to, right? Like mm. you just got to let go. It's not about for, it's not about condoning or letting someone off the hook either. Mm. Again, it comes back to forgiveness done in a way that honors where you're at, what you're feeling. Mm. So it's becoming emotionally complete with forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It's not just forgiving and yes, I forgive you and that's it. Mm -hmm. There is a detailed process to forgiveness with mm -hmm. grief recovery. It's, it's not like black and white, like it probably sounds. Mm -hmm. And like people say, well, you just have to let go. You just have to forgive. Mm -hmm. No, it's deeper than that. And we do go very deep in the program. And so that's, I want to just want to say that there is an important aspect of that. Yeah. That's not as cut and dried as people might say. I say, okay. And is it possible for you to like, maybe walk us through it quickly? Like what are the process that it entails to actually forgive during grief recovery? Yeah. And we talk about apologies mm -hmm. because oftentimes apologies that we need to give others to, right? We don't feel like we can or that the person's died. What do you, how do you give an apology when the person's died? Right? Mm -hmm. So we talk about apologies, forgiveness, um, these significant emotional statements that are not neither an apology nor forgiveness. Mm -hmm. It's emotionally dumping. Everything that we've needed to say, wanted to say, couldn't say, can't say because they've died. You don't even need to talk to the person if they're living to work on the relationship with them. You don't have to confront anybody with all this stuff that you're carrying. Because first of all, if you did, and you maybe if you're listening to this, you probably have, and that probably didn't go too well. <laughs> they get defensive, right? Mm -hmm. Cause it's, it's not about them. Mm -hmm. Everything you're holding in is about you and the mm -hmm. impact of that experience mm -hmm. on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So when I say like, go back to that place of self love, I know that what I'm holding in is not good for me. Then I have to, <laughs> I'm about to use the word, let's go again, but you know, I have to release it and yeah, for my own good, for my own health. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. We don't even know how to self love. We don't even know how to love ourselves because mm. we're so busy looking for it everywhere else. Mm. It has taken me, I'm in my forties. I did not really understand self love until my forties. Mm. Yeah. And if I knew now, in my 30, late 20s and 30s, when I when my kids were little, I would be a far different parent when my kids were young, had I known what I know now. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying it's never too late and it's never too soon to work through this stuff. Yeah. There's a lot riding on us becoming emotionally complete with our junk. Yeah. The suffering that we hold on to. Mm. And once we change able to, is hard. Yeah. Change you're, is hard for people. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're totally right. Change is, change, change is like the most constant thing on earth, but it's still the most difficult thing to experience. The most difficult thing to let. <laughs> but here's the thing. You're suffering, right? Yeah, yeah. You're already suffering. You might as well suffer and move your feet. Mm. You might as well be doing something about it. Yeah. What do you have to lose, right? Except more of your life, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And once we're able to take that giant step or that bold step, we'll be able to heal from our past traumas, we'll be able to heal from whatever, you know, for example, um, sexual abuse in the past or grief or, you know, any heartbreak that one has experienced in the past also. 
Yeah. Trauma is what happens and grief is what's left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Wow. Well, I'm Victoria. I've, I've learned so much from you already. It's like, <laughs> so much, so many questions I, I still have, you know, brewing out in me, but I'm like, okay, <laughs> like, I'll, for example, I'd love to know, like you, you said in your, in your forties now you are learning so much about, you know, self-love. I want to like, know what's like two things that you've learned about self-love, for example, that you, you wish you had learned, you know, earlier in life. It's up to me. Mm -hmm. It's up to me. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be these grand things. Yeah. You know, I don't have to like take myself on a, actually, I just took myself on like a three day, four day retreat. Oh, nice. Where did you go? To? I would have never done that before. It's yeah. actually my first ever retreat I've ever been on Yeah. with other women. And I had an amazing time and I, I realized how far I've come. Mm -hmm. It was right in front of my face, how far I've come. Yeah. And I had like this mama bear proud moment of myself <laughs> and my little inner child. Yeah. You know? yeah. It's like, what do I need to give my inner child that I never received? Hmm. And yeah. that is not a simple answer. Hmm. It's not spa days. Right. Mm hmm. Self-care yeah. is more, it's deeper than that. Yeah, it is. It is. That's, that's very true. Rich experiences. Mm -hmm. um, quenching a thirst to learn. Mm -hmm. Like though that self-love for me. Yes. Like learning something new, mm -hmm. experiencing something new, mm -hmm. deepening yeah. my relationships with myself first and foremost. What does that mean to me? What does that look like? Do I feel spiritually connected? Maintaining my own energy, looking after my energy with boundaries, you know? Yes. Yeah. I understand that. Like taking care of yourself spiritually, emotionally in every mm -hmm. way or form. Yeah. I'm talking about, you know, quenching that, that hunger to learn. I would love us to talk about your podcast, Grieving Voices. Can you tell us more about it, where we could find it, and what we could learn from it? I talked about starting that for almost two years. It was something I just, you know, I had actually the art came to me first, hmm. and then the name. And, um, yeah, it was started out of my passion to change the conversation around grief, to express how differently we all grieve and yet our experiences are so similar. Like we all learn these myths. We all show up to our grief, you know, in ways that are similar. It might be with um, alcohol. It might be with other drugs or substances. It might be with relationships. It might be, um, it we it might be just like physically right there are so many physical things that manifest within us it, disease is dis-ease in the body mm -hmm. um learning what i've learned through the guests who have been on too it's it's people are amazing and people have the capacity to turn their lives around yeah. And that is one of the things I wanted to show through the podcast too, is that no matter what terrible things have happened to you, there's hope. Mm. There's hope in every single story on my podcast. Yeah. That's good. I'm going to place the link to your website in the show of this episode. It has, there's a menu, uh, a sub menu where you can find the podcast also. And you can subscribe to it on any platform where you listen to podcasts on. It's mm -hmm. awesome. It's a must listen to for everyone who is there that wants to learn more about grief and just anyone who is there that wants to just, you know, broaden your eyes on when it comes to learning from other people's story also. That's, that's wonderful. Yeah, and it's not just like, oh, that sounds really depressing. Why would I want to listen to that? <laughs> Hear people's <laughs> sad stories, right? Mm. But we all, I always circle back to where are you today? Mm. Like, how did you get there? How did you get to where you are today? Mm. What tools and resources worked for you? Yeah. We have laughs. We mm. have 
crying moments. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's authentic. It's raw. I don't script it. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's just really raw conversation about people's stories. And a lot of them shared things they had never shared before Mm -hmm. on any other podcast. Some of them have shared their story for the first time on my podcast. Oh, that's good. That's awesome. It takes great courage. Yeah. yeah. Yes, it does. And you create like a wonderful environment for people to share their story too. So that gives it, makes it a good listen to for everyone out there. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so what was the best way to, to connect and work with you for anyone out there who still wants to ask more questions or want to work more closely with you? You know, you're, you're an energy healer. I'm Ricky master. You, you have, you have there, there are more, there's more to do than just grief, um, advocate that you do. So what's the best way to connect with you and to know more about your services and to work with you too? Yeah, my website, theunleashedheart.com. I'm also on Instagram at The Unleashed Heart and on Facebook, I think it's Victoria The Unleashed Heart. Links to everything is on my website. I'm on Mm -hmm. LinkedIn as well. Um, But yeah, my website, links to everything is there. I have a free uh, quiz Mm -hmm. about your energy type. You can learn a lot about your energy type. I have uh, free eBooks on there as well about different aspects of grief mm. and I have a bi-weekly newsletter that I have content for, that I don't share anywhere else. Mm. It's, um, and I usually, that's usually where I get a little bit more personal to mm. uh, what's happening in my life and things like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, all that is on my website. Awesome. And the podcast is available everywhere. The podcasts are available. Yes, yes, that's true. Thank you so much, Victoria. I really appreciate this wonderful conversation I had with you. Thank you so much for enlightening us and teaching us more about grief, how we could process our grief, work on our grief, and recover from our grief. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Toby. I love this. Thank you. Thank you.